Hi there. In this video, we're going to talk about violet and perfumery, and I'm going to go over five fragrances in my collection uh, that uh, have a prominent violet note or are violet solar floors. So to give you some background on violet, Viola odorata is the species of violet that has the sweet smell. It is the fragrant violet. It also happens to be the plant that we get violet leaf from. So just to clarify, I'm going to be going over the violet flower and that fragrance and how it is used in perfumery, not violet leaf. So you're not going to be hearing about Fahrenheit or Narciso Rodriguez for him or Gucci por Homme too. Violet leaves smell quite different from the flower. So they uh, have almost this cool as a cucumber, somewhat metallic, vegetal fresh sort of scent to them with a new mown grassy kind of back note to them. And unlike the flowers, which add more sort of like a plushness and a powderiness to scent, uh, the violet leaf smells very green and works best in more watery fragrances, is featured in a lot of masculine scents like the three that I just mentioned. Uh, but also violet leaf and violet flower can be used together. Uh, a lot of contemporary violet fragrances do this and it sort of takes the edge off of the very old world sort of profile of violet. Be that as it may, the violet flower note is among one of my favorites. So for Viola Vio, uh, odorata, Viola odorata, the, that particular plant, we do use the leaves in perfumery. So we do use a natural material. However, the flower has quite a low yield uh, as far as scented material. So even for solvent extraction, it would take an insurmountable amount of flowers in order to produce a very tiny amount of uh, natural material. So it's just nothing less than impractical. So let's get into the history of violet and its importance uh, throughout time. Napoleon uh, was sometimes nicknamed uh, Caporal Violette and it had actually become the emblem of the Napoleonic Imperial Party. And in England, um, it was uh, a fragrance uh, scent that was most popular during the Victorian era. Uh, the virtuous violets are often associated with modesty, humility, simplicity, demureness. And um, we started to find that the violet note really came into vogue in the late 19th century. And the reason for that is because two chemists, Tiemann and Kruger, had succeeded in synthesizing what is called the ionone. And this is actually a result of a reaction chemically between one component, citral, isolated from the Litsia cubeba essential oil, also known as Mei Chang, um, or it could also be lemongrass. So it is a reaction between either of those and with acetone. And these ionones were a valuable contribution to the history of 20th century perfumery. This synthetic alpha ionone um, enabled the perfumer to create that smell of the violet flower and even helped with iris and the sweeter aspects of other florals and also contributed to fruity flavors and the classic violet flavor. Um, it just so happens that uh, violet is just as much a flavor as a fragrance. Think of many different candies and sweets, Parma violets, Choward's violets, uh, Anise de Flavigny uh, violet pastilles and uh, pastelli uh, Lyonne uh, violet candy mints. There are liqueurs such as creme bivet and creme de violette um, that are used in popular cocktails such as the Aviation and Violette 75. Um, but getting back to its use in perfumery, these ionones would start being used in the 1890s. So to give you a little background on the root of the word too, which is pretty fascinating. So Zeus, um, who was in love with Io, had ordered the earth to create the most 
breathtakingly beautiful flower in Io's honor, which happened to be the violet. And he loved this flower. Now, in Greek, Iov, or Ion, is where we have the root of the name Ionon. So these Ionones, there are two of them, actually. Alpha, which is much more of the powdery, violety, fresh, um, billowy kind of feel of the violet flower. Beta Ionone, which is kindred to it, moving in a more berry, tobacco, rosy, um, tartar kind of um, sweetness, uh, often used together. So these started being used in the 1890s. Some of the earliest fragrances uh, were Violette en Pré, uh, Prima Violetta Bourgeois, um, Roger Gallet, uh, Vera Violetta. Many of these are no longer in production. They're not in my collection. Um, it would be wonderful to have samples of these. I'm sure that we could um, try them out at the Osmatech. Um and a little bit later, the synthesis of methyl ionones had been discovered. So these uh, are a bit easier to use in composition, and there's more facets to them. There's more sort of like an iridescence. They're softer, powdery, um, but a little bit more modern. More, uh, they found more versatility in the mid mid 20th century onward into the 21st century. Um, so there are actually three isomers of methyl ionones. There's alpha, beta, and gamma. Uh, they go, uh, they fall under uh, different brand names such as uh, Isoraldine, uh, 95, and I think there is another one um, which is uh, frequently used in perfumery. The uh, famous Sophia Grossman Hug Me Accord um, has a significant amount of methyl ionones, for example. Um, think of Trezor. So. Let's get started with this. Um, I'd like to share with you my thoughts on five violet fragrances that uh, happen to be in my collection. Um, let's dig into this. All right. So this is the earliest um, from my collection. This is actually re was released in 1913. This is composed by Ernest Deltroff, Caron, Violet Precious. So this is a nuanced violet. It's devoid of some of those less desirable trappings of the note. Um, it isn't excessively candied or oily, as a matter of fact. Um, it isn't astringent. Uh, it's ethereal. It wafts. It doesn't leave a dense cloud. It's more of an undercurrent um, there of other things such as orum blossom that provides sort of a lift and a contrast. And Ernest Eltraff seemed to be quite a fan of orange blossom because in his so-called solo floors like this and uh, Narcisse Moore, um, orange blossom are really the supporting notes. It starts off with this harmony of orange flower and violet and then blooms with other spring flowers. Uh, the muguet that is the body um, of the heart, it's just not a mere blob of, you know, hydroxy citronella, but it's a soft supporting uh, chorus for the violets. And in spite of this floral heart, it, this is unisex. It's due to that woody and, and those earthy underpinnings. And there's also an herbal vegetal element that makes this more of a natural interpretation. There's sort of a dance between the realism and the impressionism. The vetiver in the base somehow lends this human effect. Uh, it's damp, peaty, earthy, um, and it lies beneath those spring flowers as the sun shines on a late April day. It's precious indeed. Next is Orisa Legrand. <laughs> this is Violette's Duzar. Um, this uh, is rumored to be uh, resurrected from an old composition, uh, but it was resurrected in 2014 um, through the courtesy of the nose uh, Hugo Lambert. Um, and this is just testament to the fact that I'm drawn to these stuffy, antiquated fragrances like a moth to a flame. Uh, I don't know if it's some sort of olfactory cosplay. I haven't gotten into the other kind of cosplay as dressing as such, but the scents just can't get enough of. Um, I wonder if there's just some sort of past life that channels this desire. Uh, could it be that I'm just one weird guy? Uh, you know, that must be it. <laughs> well, I'll be damned if anyone tells me that the house of Rorizo Elegant doesn't get 
days of yore down to an exact science. I mean, from its irresistibly late 19th to early 20th century aesthetic, as you can see, um, its flourishes of grandeur down to the handmade tassels, like you see right here, um, right through to the compositions themselves, uh, rumored to be as close to the originals uh, from back then as could be made possible, if Renoff was withstanding. And with Violet's Dussard, my nose responds with rapturous delight. This is Parma Violets, greased up with violet leaves and cloaked in somewhat medicinal overdoses of the sarsaparilla um, sort of feeling salicylates. It's interesting, um, intriguing even. Its austerity is perverted a bit by leathery musky dry down, which makes it perfect for the gentleman with a wink and a nod. Uh, it's springtime and the dandies are randy. When this dries down, the skin warms uh, with its tolu balsam and things get a bit spicier and randier while still coated in whispers of violet and heliotrope. heliotrope. Um, there's a gentility to this. It's great stuff. And next is a more modern take. This is uh, composed by Maurice Rossel, Dante Bois from 2008, released by Frederick Mall. And I don't recall ever reaching for the adjective tangy when describing a fragrance, but there is a first for everything. Dante Bois opens uh, with this sort of tangy, meaning sort of a bit sour, a bit sweet, a bit, a bit salty. So imagine, if you will, an alternate dimension where violet had become a flavor that reached critical mass and there was a tang beverage powder. Um, it's just flavored violet. And I used to eat tang powder raw as a kid. I was weird then, just as I'm weird now. So the Don de Bra is what this violet tang would smell like, especially in the first hour of its development. Um, but what, what is this? There's, there's also pine needles in my powder as it dries down. Uh, I'm not aghast at all. Quite the contrary. That is quite tasty to me. Um, there is a fragrance material called Covone, and it's in the Ionone family that I was discussing earlier. It's produced by IFF, for which I, um, for, for which I, I, I'm just very fond of this material and I wanted to actually use it in one of my own perfumes when I was studying perfume making. It's diffusive, it's woody, simultaneously violet and pine needle. And it seems that Maurice Roussel might have used it here. Don't know that for certain. It's up for debate. However, what is irrefutable is that Cashmeran makes this dashing, smashing appearance, partnering with this heliotropin fluffiness and rendering the violet in the heart more so like a chowers violet candy after it's slowly dissolved in my mouth. Uh, the real question is, do I really like all of this? You bet your sweet bippy I do. It's hazy, it's gauzy, nearly psychedelic, which is why it may be polarizing to some who seek out the rational and straightforward in fragrance. Mal himself has stated that this is his uh, most is this is most underappreciated in his herb, and I'm inclined to agree. Uh, Muskravager may be David Bowie's Aladdin Stone, but Dante Blois is Bowie's Low. And the cashmeran uh, smells to me like it's sort of like the blurring of the lines between natural and synthetic smells. It seems woody, but so abstract that the brain, well, my brain at least, has a difficult time discerning where the wood association really has its origins. It feels woolly and, and sort of vague and just yet ever so present and enveloping. It fuses into a formula rather than rests upon it, which is often the case when cashmere is used. It's just sort of, it sort of sticks out like a sore thumb in a lot of fragrances, but it's just so well done here. Um, a deft hand is needed so that it doesn't dampen everything else. And Roussel made the ambient uh, cashmere truly beautiful here, carrying all elements to a musky cocoon in the dry down, violet powder whispers and woodland daydreams lingering for hours. This is great stuff. So now I have a public service message before I continue. The following picture is not 
a violet that is used in perfumery. That is an African violet. So it's not even actually botanically related to true violets, fragrant or otherwise. And that that's my public service announcement. Let's continue. <laughs> the next one I have is Geo F. Trump Ajaccio Violets. This is uh, very close to Viola Odorata in a bottle. Um, the small scented violets, a bushel of them, and you bury your nose in them and pick up the accompanying leaves and earth. It's almost intoxicating to the start, but then it subsides in a soothing lull. And it's somewhat rosy, still verdant, but mildly sweet. I could just swim in a Jacho violets blissfully. I could wallow in it. The windows are open. It's mid-April. Spring is near its zenith. And all the violets carpet the ground. They look almost as if they are bittersweetly smiling. A Jaccio violets is a bittersweet smile. A wistful story. An ephemeral spring. It gives me the same sense of deja vu that uh, Royal Bain de Caron or Le Bleu stir up in my mind. Memories just beyond my grasp. Distantly felt but not knowing exactly where or when, and the yearning to return to something or somewhere. I love those very personal reactions that even the least likely of fragrances can compel. And then lastly, the fifth one that I would like to profile is uh, from Jean-Charles Brousseau. This is Ville Amante. And this was released in 2005. And Violet Moth gives me the same sensation as a Helen Frankenthaler painting. So her soak stain approach uh, rendered thick, opaque oil paint to a watercolor translucency using paint thinner. And her work feels light, amorphous, yet still tangible and emotive. The violet in this release is among the most aqueous and sheer that I have experienced, with a supporting melon note adding to its wateriness, and a mint, albeit subtle, makes the experience cool and brisk. It's refreshing as an infused water, with the flavors just discernible, leaving room for the water to do what it does best, to quench. And then a half hour in, there is a stage that reminds me so much of the way actual viola odorata smells, in the flesh. <laughs> as much as I love violet forward fragrances, few have captured that ethereal headspace of the actual tiny flowers, as this one does. There is nothing powdery about viola moth. It remains cool and saturated through its mildly sweet, woody dry down. And just when I think of that it has ceased, whiffs return here and there, hours later. And you gotta love those tricky and nausea-inducing ionones. See, ionones have this interesting effect on certain olfactory bulbs where you start to lose perception of it, but then it comes back. It kind of, it's kind of almost like a phantom and it returns when you least expect it. So this is this is perfection during the summer months. So if you wanted a, a summer for a uh, summer violet forward fragrance, then uh, then uh, I would recommend Violet Month. And then there are some honorable mentions because there's just so many beautiful uh, violet notes and fragrance. Uh, take for example, uh, Le Lique Homme, uh, L'Hommage Hommage à l'Homme, uh, Guélan après lundi, uh, YSL Paris. Caron à mémoire, l'audace, audace, uh, audace uh, long discontinued, gorgeous, gorgeous stuff from the 70s, and uh, Revion Pourhomme. And of course, we cannot forget the legendary Caron Le Bleu. So that's going to do it for this video. I hope you enjoyed this. If you enjoyed uh, this content, please subscribe, like, hit the bell button to receive further notifications. And also check out my weekly live stream at Fluvium that runs on Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, unless otherwise noted. And I will see you for the next video. And until next time, be well, be kind to each other, stay safe.